Good morning, uh, good afternoon everybody and welcome to today's webinar being held by Irish's Construction Group in support of our No Time to Lose campaign. Today we have Paul Madwick, a Construction Health and Safety Manager at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals NHS and he's here to help you understand the risks involved when working outdoors in the sun for the construction industry. Good afternoon and thanks to Irish's Construction Group for inviting me to present this webinar today. Um, in this webinar, I intend to cover an overview of skin cancer from solar radiation, types of skin cancer and the number of cases in the UK and the cost to the UK. We'll then look at skin cancer from an occupational viewpoint, uh, some findings of research I've undertaken in the construction sector on this topic and we'll look at measures that can be used to reduce the risks. If you have any questions, then please send them through and I'll answer as many as I can during today's session. Any that don't get answered today, I'll aim to come back to you personally with answers. So let's start with an overview of skin cancer. People are often surprised that skin cancer is the most common cancer in the UK. And as you can see there, it accounts for around 30% of all newly diagnosed cancers and obviously places a substantial burden on health services. They think, people think that it would be high, highlighted more, but the big difference is that this is one cancer that for the majority, and if caught early, is very treatable. But not without all the fear and trauma that goes with cancer, including thoughts uh, after treatment, of will it come back? And as you'll see, the extent of removals for something that on the surface looks so small. But mostly, because in the UK we always feel that there isn't much sun, we can't actually understand why the skin cancer is a problem. Whereas in Australia and America, etc., it's understandable as it's always seen as hot and sunny. Whilst in the UK, our weather is, is more like this. Raining or at best overcast. And that's what makes the UK different. As you'll see, the risks are still there on a cloudy or overcast day, something that you don't get in Australia, America, etc. So let's understand solar radiation. Some different, uh, different images here, but if you have a look, this is all about the electromagnetic spectrum. So you can see high energy, gamma rays, x-rays, the sort of stuff that uh, you know is harmful, the sort of stuff that would need permits and set procedures and everything else to work around. And then we've got ultraviolet. And that's the big issue. We have infrared from the sun. That's the heat we feel from the sun. But the issue is the UV. UVA, this causes aging and penetrates deep into the skin. And UVB, this is predominantly responsible for the burning of the skin. And it's these two that cause skin cancer from the sun. UVC, which is even harsher than UVB and UVA, and some of UVB are still protected from us by the ozone layer. But with all the issues of holes in the ozone layer and, the, and that situation, that could lead to worse situations in the future with regard to more UVB and possibly UVC actually breaking through. The other key point to remember is that UV rays are invisible to us and they can't be felt. It's infrared that you feel on the skin, not the UV. And this is probably the key point that needs to be got across to people from an awareness point of view. This next slide with diagrams from the World Health Organization highlights some of the issues regarding UV rays. We'll look at some of these again later and they'll also be included in the awareness DVD that I'm gonna show you shortly. But as you can see, 80% of UV rays can penetrate clouds um, and shade can reduce UV, providing it's the right material that's used. Uh, reflection from water doesn't ha necessarily have to be off water, it can be off concrete or any smooth surface, that reflects UV radiation as well, so another point that, that needs thinking about. We'll now go and have a look at the different types of skin cancer. I realise this is a lunchtime uh, session, so apologies for some of the images, we've tried to keep them as, as tame as we can, but it's important to get the, the message across to you. Now, non-melanoma skin cancer, or NMSCs, are commonly found in two types. The commonest, basal cell carcinoma, accounts for 74% of all NMSC cases. These photos that you can see here are typical examples. 
The next NMSC is squamous cell carcinoma, a rarer form, much more aggressive. It can affect bone as well in the later stages of tumour growth. And these two types of skin cancer are very common in outdoor workers due to regular prolonged periods outside. But it's not just outdoor workers. You have to think about cricketers, golfers, fishermen, whether that be as a leisure time activity or actually as their profession and the ground staff, etc. that go with that. All of these people can be affected. Both types are very treatable if found early. But the next one we'll show you, this is uh, what we like to refer to as the, uh, the bad boy of skin cancer. Malignant melanoma. The increases in this form of skin cancer have been huge since the increase in popularity of package holidays to sunnier places. We've all seen people who spend the rest of the year in an indoor job burnt to a crisp on their two week holiday abroad. But research suggests this type of skin cancer is connected with intermittent, relatively high exposure to solar radiation. So as we'll see later, this can affect outdoor workers as well sort of people that aren't typically outdoors every day. So it might be a painter just popping out to do a few hours outside or maybe an electrician. They're the typical sort of trades that we're thinking of there. Cancer research in its latest advice, which does back, date back to 2010, uh, advises that the risk of developing malignant melanoma during a person's life is one in 55 for men and one in 56 for women. So uh, it's a quite quite a high percentage there and as you see when we move on to the stats malignant melanoma is the big hitter in terms of fatalities from skin cancer as you'll see from looking at statistics here there's over a hundred thousand new cases and that was back in 2011 but under reporting is thought to be considerable, with cancer research advising the underreporting of 30% for squamous cell carcinoma and up to 50% for basal cell carcinomas. So looking at the figures there, the 102,000, that's nearly 2,000 new cases a week and over 12 deaths a week as well from what is the considered the, the more har uh, harmless type of skin cancer. Most underreporting is thought to uh, be due to receiving treatment at GP practices, and these treatments are often not reported. And research has shown that underreporting by dermatologists themselves on their epiderm reporting system is, is down by a third. Many cancer registries record only the first NMSC of each type per person, and information on early stage NMSC is the sort of thing that's typically treated in primary care or the private sector may never reach the registries used to record skin cancer. So this is why the figures are sort of all over the place and, uh, and not as accurate as we'd like them to be. Non-melanoma skin cancer is advised by cancer research to increase roughly by 6% year on year. And this has been the case for many decades. Now we go on to the malignant melanoma. As you can see, far fewer cases but the fatality rate is much higher. With the NMSCs that we've just looked at, 638 fatalities from just over 102,000 cases. Whereas with this, just over 13,000 people, but the death rate is over 2,000. So as you can see, three times that from NMSCs, with approximately, which has approximately eight times as many cases annually. And this really highlights why malignant melanoma is the type everybody is worried about. And interestingly, unlike most other health issues, the prevalence is much greater in affluent areas. And I guess this goes back to the package holiday, foreign holiday thing that we've talked about previously. So let's look at the areas that are typically affected. As you can see, for men, it's the trunk of the body and head and neck as well. For ladies, it's the legs, typically the back of the legs. And that obviously is down to, to clothing that's warm. Now, the next couple of slides will emphasize the extent of removal of tumors back to healthy skin. So uh, if you're a little bit squeamish, perhaps you need to uh, just look away for a second. As you can see, what on the surface on the left-hand side looks very small 
is actually like an iceberg with much more area affected below the surface that needs to be removed to get back to unaffected tissue. Another example here, which shows small area, but the, the, the area that's left there after the uh, removal of the tumour. Now we've looked at the little bits about removal, which we'll, we'll talk about again later. Let's look at the cost to the UK. As you can see, this research shows the huge cost to the NHS. We're looking at 106 to 112 million pounds per year. But as you can see, that's only 42% of the overall cost. The remaining 58% is a cost to the employer in terms of sick pay, cost of replacement and cover, training, that sort of stuff. So whilst the 42% affects us as the taxpayer, the 58% is obviously going to have an impact on us as well. So it's a lose-lose situation for something that's basically entirely preventable. And as you can see there, we've already said that uh, cancer research advised that the increase is 6% plus per year. And the estimate by 2020 is 180 plus million pounds to treat skin cancer in the NHS. But this isn't just the UK, a global issue that needs awareness. Many other countries have spent time on national campaigns with the Slip Slop Slap campaign in Australia probably being the most famous that's run for many years with notable successes and is aimed at the whole population starting from small children so that the culture is there and works its way through so it's a natural thing to do to cover up and protect yourself when out in the sun. Other examples are on the slide here are from America and from Denmark which surprisingly has an extremely high malignant melanoma rate. So what about the UK? Well to date the UK has not had such extensive campaigns with examples here from Cancer Research, the Department of Health and perhaps one that you've seen before from the HSE. A sun safety culture still needs establishing in the UK with awareness in place from preschool onwards and this is something that obviously people are out there now striving to achieve. So we've looked at the, the general side of things in the UK. We now move on to construction workers. The next couple of images show a common perception of construction followed by the actual reality. These are the images that the media would like to have you think that all the construction workers uh, look like, but the reality is actually um, quite different to say the least. If you look top right, you can see the site manager there leaning, leaning on the side of the scaffold, seems quite happy with what he's seeing, but perhaps all he's seeing is good progress on bricking up the gable end of the new house. Perhaps he's not actually had any awareness on skin cancer and working in the sun, so he can't offer advice to the people that are working for him. At least the guy on the left has actually had a bit of initiative and he, he's protecting his neck. But this is the reality, which isn't surprising really. Now we'll have a look at now at the numbers affected by solar radiation in the construction industry. The first detail is from research commissioned by the HSE. This study, headed by Dr. Leslie Rushton of Imperial College London, looked at cancers attributable to occupation. They received registrations of new cases and deaths held on existing medical databases, such as typically Thor and Epiderm. They found that construction had considerably more cancer registration and deaths from solar radiation than any other sector. And as you see there, 56% of solar radiation in construction, a lot more than any other sector. And solar radiation itself accounted for 11% of all occupational health registrations. Now bearing in mind that the data that Leslie used is now 11 years old, if we increase the number of cases year on year by 6%, which cancer research suggests is the average rise, then the 841, which is probably an underestimate at any rate, would now become 1596. And even this, as we said, is likely to be an underestimate for all the reasons we've outlined before. 
I think this chart from Leslie Rushton's work shows clearly the level of risk caused by skin cancer from the sun. And whilst number two to asbestos, which was highlighted as having nearly 3,000 cases, the risk of skin cancer from the sun has largely been overlooked to date, uh, with a lot more numbers than some of the other things that you would imagine to see, such as lead, silica, wood dust, that sort of thing. But all of the research that, that uh, Leslie undertook for the HSE was for non-melanoma skin cancer. So what about the malignant melanoma, the one that we've, we've talked about? The original study from the HSE didn't include malignant melanoma, so IOSH commissioned Leslie and her team to revisit this element of the burden of occupational cancer. As you can see, it was important to get the numbers to try and give a clearer overall picture of skin cancer from solar radiation attributed to work. So when you look at the figures there, 42% were construction. 239 new registrations, 46 deaths, with 44% being construction. And that's in a single typical year. And again, data which goes back to 2011, 2012. So we know that the figure is going to be uh, considerably more than that. But it actually gets worse for construction, unfortunately. Researchers from the University of Manchester found from reviewing cases reported in Thor Network that some construction workers were up to nine times more likely to get skin cancer than other workers from a similar social group and background. This research was published in Occupational Medicine at the same time as a, a paper on my pilot study. And it shows that the chips are really down when you also consider that those who've already had skin cancer are nine times more likely to get a reoccurrence than those who haven't had it. It's, uh, you know, it's something to, uh, the, the, it's big numbers when you start adding all of that up. So definitely action was required. This is the pro, uh, project I've been working on, Sun Safety and Construction. And I started on this project back in 2011, after having successfully secured funding from IOSH for both the research element and development of an awareness DVD. Obviously, this has had to be tied in with uh, trying to do a day job as well. I secured a fantastic steering group, which included the lead for occupational health and construction from the HSE, an occupational hygienist from Tata Steel, and a council member of BOHS, a past IOSH president, and occupational psychologists from Loughborough and the University of Nottingham. So a good basis from which to start the project. And after extensive research on existing scientific knowledge on the topic from across the world, of which there was very little from the UK, then developed the different stages. So I developed a baseline questionnaire and the awareness DVD specifically for the construction sector, which we'll see in a, in a moment. Um, Unfortunately, if you remember, summer 2012 was the wettest summer on record, so not really the ideal time to uh, get companies to talk about uh, working in the sun. Uh, and because, as we've already said, that the awareness of working on an overcast or cloudy day didn't, uh, didn't automatically twig with people that that was actually uh, a risk of skin cancer, um, there was a lot less take up than what was originally uh, proposed with some of the different companies. But anyway, we, we, uh, we battled on. Um, and after the, the questionnaire, the DVD was, was shown, after the questionnaire, the initial questionnaire was completed and sent back, the DVD was shown. And then we went back a year later uh, to those that had given their contact information uh, and sent out an, another more basic questionnaire to see if the awareness had actually changed things. Now, what I'd like to do now is, uh, is show you the DVD, which is, is very practical, no scientific terms. We're not talking different types of skin cancer. We're talking skin cancer as a whole. Lots of content to help alter existing attitudes, behaviours and the culture in the sector towards sun safety. So we show you the 12 minute DVD now and you can see what employers and managers watched and hopefully this will act as a summary of what we're going to discuss a bit later on. So let's have a look at that now.
In the UK, everyone looks forward to the good weather and some sunshine. However, with sunny weather comes the risk of sunburn and potentially skin cancer. Skin cancer is by far the most common type of cancer in the UK, with figures from Cancer Research estimating that there are as many as 100,000 new cases each year. Around 50% of work-related cases of the most common type of skin cancer are in the construction industry. The scale of the problem within construction has prompted the making of this film that will give you the facts about skin cancer caused by the sun and suggest some ways of minimising your risk when working outside in the summer months. If detected early, there is a 95% success rate in treating this type of cancer, a far better rate than for most other types of cancer. However, if left to develop, some types of skin cancer can spread via lymph nodes and into the immune system to other organs within the body, causing secondary cancers. In the most severe cases, skin cancer can be fatal. But whilst rarely fatal, treatment often involves surgery to cut out the cancer. The process can be traumatic from finding the tumour, awaiting diagnosis from your GP or specialist, the removal process, the wait for test results to find out whether the tumour was cancerous, and then, for larger removals, reconstructive surgery. Many who have had skin cancer get further tumours. Cancer research advises that the risk can be increased by as much as nine times. The skin is very complex, with several different layers, each with its own role. When a tumour forms, often it can be like an iceberg, with only a small area visible on the surface, but with substantially more area affected by cancerous cells below. It's this iceberg that causes most surprise to the patient after surgery, when they realise how much has had to be cut out to ensure all of the cancer has been removed and only healthy cells remain. The most common areas for skin cancer are on the back, neck and sometimes the back of the legs. You may have found that it is hard to apply sun cream to these areas. Some people are more likely than others to develop skin cancer. If you have lots of moles or freckles, light-coloured eyes, or have red or fair hair, then you will be more at risk because people with any of these characteristics typically burn easily. Irrespective of your skin type, staying in the sun until your skin goes pink or red is a physical sign that you have already caused damage to your skin. Repeatedly letting this happen can lead to you developing skin cancer. People sometimes assume that bright sunshine is the cause of skin cancer. However, what actually causes it is ultraviolet or UV radiation that comes from the sun. Cancer research advises that the main periods of risk in the UK are the months April to mid-September, with the highest levels of UV rays being present between 11am and 3pm. UV rays penetrate skin cells, causing sunburn, skin ageing and DNA damage. It's this damage that can cause you to develop skin cancer. UV rays are invisible and cannot be felt on the skin. The heat of the sun that you feel comes from infrared rays. A common misconception is that the risk only exists when there is bright sunshine. This is wrong. UV rays are still present on a cloudy or overcast day. 30 to 40% of UV rays will still penetrate through dense cloud cover and up to 80% if only half the sky is covered in cloud. UV rays are also present from reflections, not just from metal roofs, coverings or glass, but 5 to 10% off the surface of water, 15% off sand and 10% off concrete surfaces. So you may be exposed even if you think you are in the shade. There are 10 sun safety measures which can minimise the risks of sunburn and skin cancer when working outdoors. A sensible workable approach is needed, as not all measures might be practical or suitable in your work environment. A combination of several measures might suit, but you, and for some options your employer, need to consider these to come up with a choice you can work with. We'll now look at each measure. Drinking plenty of water is important for healthy skin, which will help to minimise the impact from the sun on your skin. This was the measure most used by construction workers questioned in an independent survey, with nearly 9 out of 10 saying they already did this. The clients or principal contractor supplying the welfare facilities, including the toilets and the area to take your breaks, must by law supply water that is suitable for you to drink. Tap water is fine. Bottled water is only necessary if running water isn't available. The same survey found that 6 out of every 10 construction workers questioned used sun lotion at work, but strangely, 9 out of 10 used it when on holiday. 
Many sites now have sun lotion dispensers or provide single-use sachets for you to use. And there are many sun lotions on the market which are quick drying and non-greasy, so dust and dirt won't stick to your skin. When you use sun lotion, the following points are important. Ensure the sunscreen you use has UVA and UVB protection and a solar protection factor SPF rating of 30 as well as a 4 star rating. Don't scrimp. You need to put at least a teaspoonful on each arm, leg, front and back of the body and at least half a teaspoonful to the face every time you put on sun lotion. Make sure you leave enough time for the cream to soak in before going out in the sun. Make sure you reapply cream regularly during the day, remembering to wash your skin beforehand. Remember, you need to put the lotion on all areas which are not covered and could be exposed to the sun. Don't forget your neck, head, ears and back. The next measures involve clothing and personal protective equipment, or PPE. Another area of the body which can be affected by UV radiation is the eyes, with damage leading to cataracts or even cancer in the eye. When selecting sunglasses, you need to remember, choose wraparound types to prevent the sun creeping in at the sides, ensure the sunglasses have a marked UV rating of 400 and with a label stating 100% UV protection. You probably haven't seen many wide-brimmed hats with neck protection on a construction site, as normally hard hats must be worn at all times. Hard hats don't usually have cover for the neck, however, some manufacturers produce neck protection that can be attached to your hard hat. Where neck protection is not provided or available, you need to think about how you can cover and protect your neck. When it's hot and you're doing lots of manual work, probably the last thing you would think to wear would be lots of clothes. However, in Australia, parts of the USA and other countries where the weather is far hotter and sunnier than the UK, it's very common for workers to wear long sleeve tops and long trousers when working outside. The clothing is designed for working outdoors, and whilst harder to find, it is available in the UK. Such clothing is designed to be both comfortable when working outdoors and to offer protection by being quick drying, soaks up sweat so you don't feel wet, high wicking, moves sweat, moisture away from your skin quickly, UV protecting, the material will have been tested and therefore has a UV protection rating or UPF. Look for a UPF of at least 30 plus. Remember, where clothing or PPE is provided to you by your employer, you must, by law, make sure that you wear it. The next sun safety measures can only be achieved with the cooperation of your employer or the principal contractor for the site on which you are working. Where possible, between 11am and 3pm, work should be undertaken away from direct sunlight, either inside or in a shaded area. Any canopy or cover provided for shade should be made from a fabric or material that is fire rated and has been tested for UV protection with a UPF rating of 30 plus. Obviously this is only suitable in areas where the worker is positioned in one area for a period of time and where plants such as forklifts and excavators are not needed for the task. Where it is not possible for everybody to work away from direct sunlight or provide shade, thought should be given to the rotation of workers so that as little time as possible is spent working in direct sunlight. In the same way that you or perhaps the site manager check the weather forecast for the next day or even further, it is possible to check the UV level forecast. The UV level is often given in newspapers, websites and on television or radio forecasts. The UV level will usually be listed as a number, which will then be grouped as low, medium or high. This information will enable you and the site manager to prepare for the level of protection needed. Checking your skin is the final sun safety measure. The earlier the detection and diagnosis, the more effectively skin cancer can be treated. The best way to detect skin cancer is to spend a couple of minutes checking your skin at least once a month. You need to start from the top of your body and work your way down, paying particular attention to the areas of your skin which are typically uncovered and exposed to the sun. Check your head, face, neck and chest right down to your hips. Look in a mirror or get someone else to check the areas you can't easily see, such as the back of your head, ears and back. Next, check your arms, elbows, including your underarms and both sides of your hands.
Finally, check your lower body, legs, front and back, feet, and even between your toes and the soles of your feet. When checking your body, you're looking for any marks on the skin that appear to be growing, bleeding or changing appearance in any way. A spot or sore that does not heal within four weeks. A spot, mole or sore that itches, hurts, scabs, crusts or bleeds for more than four weeks. Areas of skin that become sore or an ulcer forms for no apparent reason and again it doesn't heal up within four weeks. Checking moles is particularly important as the most serious form of skin cancer often starts from moles on your skin. There is an ABCD, easy guide to checking moles. Asymmetry. The two halves of the mole may differ in their shape and not match. Border. The outside edges of the mole or area may appear to be blurred and sometimes show notches or look ragged. Colour. This may be uneven and patchy. You may see different shades of black, brown and pink. Diameter. Typically, this type of skin cancer is at least 6 mm in diameter, larger than the rubber on top of a pencil. If any mole gets bigger or changes, tell your doctor. It is very important that you visit your GP immediately if you think you found any of these points when checking your skin. You will never be criticised for getting it checked out. Skin cancer is on the increase, but by following the guidance in this film, you can help to protect yourself from this entirely preventable form of skin cancer. Okay, so as I said, hopefully you, you've seen a very practical DVD with no scientific terms. We're trying to help improve attitudes and, and awareness and obviously behaviours and move the culture on within the sector towards better sun safety. The next few slides show some of the results from the baseline questionnaire. So as you'll see, a good mix of ages and a good geographical spread of workers across the UK were, were originally, uh, originally completed the questionnaire. And then baseline results, a wide range of trades and managers to try and get a, a, good, a good mix, so we're pleased with that. Average working time outdoors for the, for the majority was uh, eight hours. And as expected, for the majority of workers, mostly pale skin, easily burnt in the sun. This is some of the, some of the other results we had back to questions that we asked. So as you can see, nearly 60% of people had been sunburnt in the last 12 months and nearly three quarters had not checked their whole body uh, and under 20% had had their skin checked by a health professional and what we realized when we uh, put the, uh, the DVD together doing the research was that the actual checking of the skin had never been filmed before so even those that said that they had checked their skin did they actually know what they were looking for when they were checking their skin? That's why we took some time to, to film that. And over 70% had never had any sun safety training. So it's, it's no wonder that the awareness was, was actually poor. A central element of the awareness DVD was discussion of 10 sun safety measures. And these were based on the findings of a global literature review undertaken by Charlotte Young of the Health and Safety Laboratory. So um, we'll go through the, uh, the 10 now and do it top of the pop style. We'll start at number 10, work our way down. 
So the first one, 13% of people said they did this. Checking the UV forecast for the day. Um, this is shown by the Met Office, and it's also on BBC Weather uh, during the, the, the key part, the uh, April to September time. And the thing is that uh, technology's moved on considerably even since the start of this project. There's so many different apps now, and the BBC Weather app and the, the app from the Met Office clearly show the UV rating. Sometimes it's not a number, as shown here. Sometimes it's low, medium, and high. But you can actually look at that uh, and uh, work out what uh, what actually uh, is required for that particular day. Here's an example of uh, the Met Office one showing low, as I said. Uh, number nine, the wearing of wide brim hats with neck protection. Very difficult on a construction site, but we've tried to show an example there that, that there are things available. Um, any clothing needs to have a UPF rating of 50 plus on it to prove the level of protection. The bottom right photo is a compromise. Obviously, the guy's there got his uh, got his collar up, but at least he's he's thinking about it. Where on the left, that's an after purchase add-on product that can go with a, a safety helmet. Uh, it would be nice to see that as the norm, but obviously with all of these things, there has to be the bulk of people actually using them so that people feel comfortable and prepared to uh, to do, do that themselves. At number eight, it's rotating jobs to minimise the amount of time working in direct sunlight. 22% said they did this, but generally this decision would need to be down to a supervisor where possible. Uh, but it doesn't hurt to encourage this and it, it obviously depends on the, the size of the site uh, and, and what works going on but as we said at the beginning the uh, the 10 sun safety measures is a bit of a mix and match I'm not expecting all 10 measures to be in place at number seven you need to provide shade and cover to your work area now this can be a temporary pop-up tent the sort of thing that you used to see on ground force or DIY SOS Again, the material must have a UPF rating, and it should be fire retardant as well. Um, but it might be possible, and on, on bigger sites, it might be possible to have a more permanent arrangement. 26% said that they did this. Um, the other thing as well is to make sure that the material is able to cope with the UK's changeable weather that we've already talked about in, uh, at length. At number six... 28% said they did this, was to avoid minimize, avoid or minimise work in direct sunlight in the middle of the day. Key times to avoid are between 11 and 3. And if possible, this time period could include some work inside or perhaps in a shaded area. No one's expecting people to go off and have a four-hour lunch break. The key months, as we've already said, April through to September. Then at number five, Wear long sleeve loose fitting tops and trousers. 46% of people said they did this. Fabric technology is available to achieve this. Mid layer clothing used by walkers, etc., achieve the three points the quick drying, the high wicking, and generally UV protecting as well. But again, you're looking for uh, the UPF factor on the material. And by using the right material, you can ensure that it doesn't affect the worker. The last thing you want to do is to give them clothing that then creates the potential for heat stroke uh, and it's very uncomfortable for, for them to work in the, in the material. Now such products are available and some are wholesaler makes, not big name, big price brands. However, because people haven't asked the question generally in the past, the detail in catalogues is presently very poor. So what you'll have to do is speak to your supplier who in turn will probably scratch his head and have to go off and investigate this for you. But I know that some of the, some of the big uh, safety uh, clothing providers do do UPF rated clothing, but they, they just don't advertise that within their catalogues. At number four, wearing sunglasses. Obviously in the work environment, these need to be safety glasses with a CE marking they need to be marked UV 400 and 100% UV protection. Uh, these have become more common over the last couple of years and the prices have started to drop as well. So I guess that's why people are prepared to, uh, to buy them. 
50% who completed the baseline questionnaire said that they had these. Cancer of the eye is quite common, so this item should be a serious consideration and the cost isn't too prohibitive either. At three, over 50% said that they checked exposed areas of their skin, but in researching for the awareness DVD, couldn't find any film checks on how to do this properly. So how do they know that what they're actually checking, they're, they're checking properly? What, you know, what bits they're missing out, like particularly behind the back of the ears and that sort of thing, which aren't, aren't an obvious thing. And, and as we've already talked about, the, the biggest percentage of skin cancer in men is on the trunk. So you're looking on the back and so quite often you need someone else to actually have a look and, and uh, just check for you because it is quite difficult doing the uh, thing in a mirror, as you can see from the images on there. Uh, but very important um, so that's something to, to bear in mind uh, and, and that's why there was a detailed section produced for the awareness DVD uh, that you've seen and whilst people won't talk about it a lot of occupational health practitioners I've talked about will said that people will take that on board and now they know what they need to do they will actually make them checks themselves at number two 60% said they used sun lotion and sunscreen, but it became clear through both the research and the focus groups that many only applied it once a day, didn't use enough, and didn't allow time for it to soak in before going out in the sun. So a full sense of security has been created. Now, detail on this was covered in the, the DVD, but it's important that the manufacturer's instructions are followed uh, the British Dermatological Association suggests that an SPF rating of 30 and at least 4 star uh, is used. Now SPF is sun protection rating and that is for the UVB elements, so that's against sunburn. And the star rating is for UVA, which is for ageing, etc. Now you might see different things on the, the actual bottle or on, on what's being used and the problem is that there isn't really a international standard so people do put different things on the labeling the star rating as I understand it was introduced by boots uh, and it's seen as the norm now so that's why people put a star rating on there but they're not obliged to do that so it's important to read the the label uh, and just be confident in your own mind that it is actually achieving what you want it to achieve so it might not say SPF it might say UV etc but it's looking at the rating the 30 is important because people don't put on as much as they should do uh, and for the other reasons that we've said and people obviously sweat whilst they're, whilst they're manually working and that can rub the, the sun cream off. It's also, uh, another point is it's also very difficult for a site manager to know whether sun cream's actually been applied. Whereas if people are wearing clothing uh, you know, loose, loose fitting, long sleeve tops and trousers. It, you can see straight away whether people have got ad adequate amount of protection for the majority of their body, and that way you're only using a small amount of sunscreen in a small area to actually provide the protection that you need. And the big one, number one, ninety-one percent of respondents said that they drank plenty of water. Now water consumption is good because obviously the skin needs that to remain healthy but it's not an adequate measure on its own. Um, and I was initially surprised that drinking water was number one but people, from talking to people, it seemed that, that such as the RSPCA had actually undertaken effective campaigns reminding owners in the summer to leave the window down and plenty of water for animals so, for when they get hot and that had actually sunk into people's minds. Um, so quite bizarre really, but it just shows that a good awareness campaign can actually make a difference. But I guess the key message is, if there's any doubt, you need to get it checked out. That the 10 measures that we've shown are a mix and match suggestion. Uh, they need to be considered dependent on the type of work. They need to look at the duration of the work, number of workers in the area, the work environment, good old sort of things that you're looking at when you assess risk. There's no totally correct answer uh, just from looking and not assessing the above points. So it needs to be something, it needs to be a systematic approach to actually see what would actually work in that particular work environment and for that particular worker. Um, 
But going back to the slide here, a key message, especially for men who are notorious for not going to see their doctor uh, until often things are at an advanced stage, is to adopt the sun safety measures and to reduce your risk of skin cancer. And if you're concerned, you need to go and see your GP. The GP won't be concerned in the least if you do go and see them. It's not a waste of time, you know, and hopefully it's nothing to be concerned about, but you don't know and leaving it is, is not a good option. In addition, a little plug for IOSH here, uh, a selection of the documents published by IOSH, which can help you in controlling the skin cancer and solar radiation in your workplace, are on the No Time To Lose uh, website. So the web, web address is there, have a look. There's quite a bit of stuff that can be downloaded. There's also a slightly different version of the, the video that you've seen today, uh, which is which is badged up for no time to lose. But what I wanted to show you today was the one that we'd actually done as part of the research. Uh, and there's a couple of bits that, that are missing in the uh, the edited version that, that's on the, the website, such as uh, the section on uh, checking your skin. It's stills rather than actually a video of, of how that's actually done. Now, one element of the follow-up work in 2013 was a series of focus groups I undertook with the group shown below, which was quite a broad mix, as you can see, including size and type of company and some specialist uh, contractors as well. Now, I've gone through and I've collected half a dozen examples of discussion points to highlight how the topic was actually uh, received. Uh, now, the people that were in the focus groups had seen the uh, DVD, uh, and so the, the comments, so they've seen the awareness and the comments are based around that. Now, I've tried to keep the slides as, uh, as clear as I can, but however, because these are direct quotes, they're quite wordy. So apologies for that, but it's the only way you could actually get to have a look at it. Now, the first example, this quite shocked me. This is a guy who was quite matter of fact about the skin cancer that he'd had. So I'll let you have a read of that. So as you can see, um, a prime candidate for, for perhaps um, moving the awareness on a little bit further and just seeing what they are actually doing. This guy was saying that if it was a really, really hot day, he had some spray suntan uh, cream, he'd spray himself first thing in the morning and that was it for the day. The next example this is the oh by the way approach, which is actually um, quite common, as we've talked about. I think it's fair to say that 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 men are notoriously bad for going to the GP, and when they do go and they see the GP or a nurse and they actually feel comfortable with that person, then out pops a huge shopping list of medical ailments that they have to deal with in that one sitting because uh, otherwise they might not get the chance to see them again for a, for a very long period of time. The next example, this is a, a common statement f uh, from outdoor workers, particularly those that are, that are slightly older uh, and uh, things have changed considerably. And if we go on to, to the next part,
from talking to them after this, it was basically considered a perk. They uh, they worked out in all the wet weather and the horrible weather where where no one really wanted to work outside. So in the summertime, if they could turn up in just a pair of shorts and their boots, they saw that as their their perk from working through the uh, the terrible weather in the winter. This is a uh, senior manager's response. And this next example just shows that the education and awareness process continues. And then finally, this is perhaps the future. I guess you could say that this person sort of uh, got what we're trying to achieve. And finally, I want to just um, go through a few slides that show from analysing the pre and post intervention questionnaires that, uh, that it did actually make a difference having that awareness out there. As you can see, there was improvement in the use of all 10 sun safety measures in the 12 months following watching the awareness film. Uh, for this slide, just for clarification, for this slide, I've only shown the results from those who did see the film. So the intervention group before completing the post intervention questionnaire, but the control group's results were nowhere near as good. And the next couple of slides will actually will show that. While still far too high, at least people have started to see having a suntan is not good for your skin. And then going on to need to wear sunscreen and lotion on a cloudy or overcast day. The message that UV is still present on a cloudy or overcast day appears to have been taken on board. And as I've said previously, this is a key message that we need to get across. Use of shade and cover when working in the sun. Improvements here as well, but not for the control group who, who didn't see the film. And then wearing long sleeve loose fitting tops and trousers when working in the sun. A far more certain and better option than relying on the correct use of sunscreen on large areas of the skin, as, as we've already talked about. So, some final thoughts. TUC have highlighted that 90% of all skin cancer deaths could be prevented if people properly controlled their exposure. And it's nice to think that by doing our bit and chipping away at people's levels of awareness, that attitudes and behaviours can slowly change. key points from the video which I, I think need to be taken away more than anything else that you can burn even on an overcast day that you need to use a selection of measures to help protect yourself and it's not use everything it's use a selection and if you find a mole scab or sore that worries you go and see your GP another little plug for the no time to lose campaign if you haven't had a look yet Go time to the No Time to Lose website to pick up resources, guidance and to help improve sun safety in your workplace. And that's basically basically it. I'll have a look. Uh, I think I've answered some of the questions as, as we've gone through. Um, Nadine asked about uh, concerns about liability when providing sun cream uh, and allergies and still getting burnt. 
what I would say is it, it's really the same, Nadine, as um, the three-stage kit that you've probably got in your welfare facility. Some people can be allergic to that as well. And so it's a little bit like, um, I guess, using a cleaning product. They always tell you to try it in an inconspicuous uh, area. Um, and so what I would say there is people know whether they've got sensitive skin or not. And the advice is really to, to try it in a small area, maybe try a little bit on the wrist or whatever, and see if it flares up. Uh, and if that's the case, then, then they need to be looking at other forms of protection, either cream from another manufacturer or or looking at covering themselves over with clothing as far as they can. So it, it is a difficult one, um, but saying, well, we're, we're not going to supply anything uh, because there might be someone that's allergic to it, which I know some companies do say is, is probably not the answer. And I, and I would like to think that uh, the occupational health team within the HSE w would agree with what I'm saying there, uh, that, that really, you know, you, you do need to have measures in place and, and providing nothing is, is not really uh, an answer. Uh, and as we've already said before, um, sunscreen, it's very hard to know whether people have put it on or, or not at any rate. Uh, let's have a look what else have we got. Yeah, uh, Paul's asked about clothing, a UPF it's all it's all acronyms unfortunately SPF for your sunscreen that's 30 but the UPF rating for clothing should be at least 50 it should be 50 plus it should say it in there and for it to achieve that it must have been tested in the laboratory um, the, there's a fair few different places that do that including the health and safety laboratories they do that sort of thing um, but it should say UPF and and what the rating is uh, and as I say, that is that is the best practice. Right, a couple of a couple of people have asked about the uh, about the DVD as well. Um, today's session has been recorded, so you should be able to watch the um, the video as as part of that. Um, there is also an edited version, as I say, on the No Time to Lose website. Um, have a look at that. Um, there's only a couple of changes. There's more uh, branding for no time to lose. Uh, the main change is the fact that there's some stills there um, when it comes to self-checking uh, your skin. But that's not. Um, have a look at it and see if that covers what you need with your with your staff. Um, that's it, really. I, I think from the uh, from the IT side of things, it should work. The video. I've got a nod, so uh, we'll take that as a yes. Right, a question about SPF should be used for African countries. Um, that's a good question. I, I don't really know the answer to that. I, I think the thing is there, you need to look at the employees that are actually working there because it's about skin type. So uh, the UK skin type is, is very, it's pale, fair haired, light colored eyes. The, the darker the skin type, uh, the less the less issues there are um, but people still need to be careful so I, I you would have to take some other advice on that but that's you know that's my understanding it's, it's really about uh, skin type and I think that is all the questions dealt with okay uh, one other one is sunburn a reportable injury? Um, not as far, not as far as I know. Uh, obviously, um, Ridor, the categories within Ridor have been altered recently, uh, and and quite um, well, quite reduced. Um, from talking to the HSE, and obviously the HSE were involved with the project. They have also they've said that. Um, they're looking for improvement, but generally the awareness the awareness hasn't been out there about skin cancer, and that's what we're trying to achieve now. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't have thought so, but that might be something you need to speak to the HSE about, um, you know, for that particular instance. 
So that's it really. Thank you very much for, for all your um, uh, attention to this and hopefully it's proved useful to you. As I say, there is a recording of this going to be available in about a day's time. Yeah, um, so um, that's that. There is an email there as well. If, if you've got a burning question, if you pardon the pun, uh, and you haven't, uh, you haven't thought about it today, but uh, you want to get in touch, by all means, give me an email, and I will do my best to get back in touch with you. Thank you very much for listening.